the storm and winds may... Hi, I'm Terry Townsend, minister here at the New Concord Church of Christ in New Concord, Ohio. I want to personally thank you for joining us today via this live stream. The purpose of this stream is to simply share the good news of Jesus Christ. While we appreciate you viewing this stream, this effort is in no way intended to be a substitute for the assembling together with the saints. We recognize, however, that there are circumstances that arise that might prevent someone from attending church service. And for this reason, we provide a means whereby people like you can hear the gospel preached. We hope you enjoy today's message from God's Word. Please feel free to share this stream. If you're ever in the New Concord, Ohio area, we'd love for you to drop by and visit with us. We meet every Sunday morning beginning at 9.15 a.m. for Bible class, again at 10 a.m. for worship, and again 6 p.m. for our evening worship. See you soon. You hold me in your mighty arms forever safe. morning. It's good to see all of you out this morning. Beautiful looking crowd. 
Turn your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter. Back towards the end of the New Testament. Come back a couple books from Revelation to 1 Peter. And we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 in just a moment. Appreciate, Scott, the songs that were sung, the last one especially. And as I said in Bible class this morning, we often say from this pulpit that I'm, I'm looking forward to the day when God will wipe away all the tears. Because in this life we all know that there is suffering, there's grief and sorrow that comes, there's hardships, and we, we struggle, don't we? I know for many of you, even this day, the loss of some loved ones. I look out and I see, since I've just, in the short time I've been here, some empty places, some empty seats of those who've gone before. And our hearts are saddened because of that. But I, I realize and recognize, and I take comfort in scriptures like where John says, Blessed are those who die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they might rest from their labors and their works do follow them. I take comfort in that. But I, but I understand that, you know, that in life, as long as we're here, we're, we're going to have tears. We're going to cry. We're going to have uh, problems. And I think Peter is addressing that here in this great book. It's in 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to look at the first 11, 12, 13 verses this morning. And Peter, throughout the first epistle, he's dealing with, with suffering, Christians who suffer. I believe it was C.S. Lewis who was asked the question, why do the righteous suffer? And we ask that sometimes, don't we, ourselves. Or we've had people ask us that question and C.S. Lewis responded by saying, well, why not? They're the only people on earth that can deal with it or handle it. And that may come across as or seen as being arrogant. I, I don't see it that way. I, I think he's absolutely right. And I think that's what Peter was trying to say in this first epistle. That you're going to suffer, the righteous will suffer, but you know what? We can deal with it. We can handle it. We, instead of being victims, can be victors. Instead of uh, um, going through life with, with no hope, we have, we have hope. And Peter is addressing that here. If you have your Bibles open, let's put up on the board. I, I want to read from the English Standard Version today. I, I like the way it reads. In, in 1 Peter 4, beginning at verse 1, Since therefore, now it's therefore a reason, and if you recall back in chapter 3, he's uh, going through some things and, and talking about uh, verse 15, that we are to be ready to give an answer of the hope that's within us. And then he goes and he begins talking about it, or makes reference to Noah, and then baptism, wherefore baptism doth now also save us as he comes to or concludes his thoughts on Noah. Remember Noah uh, and his family found grace or favor in God's sight. They lived in a world full of wickedness. People's hearts were on evil and minds were on evil continually, but not Noah. There was something different about this fella and the waters of the flood back there in Genesis chapter 6, that Peter alludes to, served as a line of demarcation between the old life and now the new. And Noah had come through those waters and now a new life. The sinful world was destroyed. And that's what baptism does. It destroys that and, and, and it rids us of the sin that's in our life. That old man of sin, Romans 6, that Brad just read for us, a moment ago, is, is put to death and we're raised up new creatures in Christ. And then he goes on and talks about the suffering of Christ. How that he suffered and died, but he resurrected and gives us hope. So all those things he has been talking about, and he's reminding his readers that like Christ suffered, so will we. 
But as that old world before Noah, before the flood rather, was destroyed, we put to death an old man of sin. We're living a different type of life now, at least we're supposed to be. And he's reminding his readers and you and I of that. And then he goes on and says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, humanity, while he was here, he says, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. He, I believe he's referring there, talking to those of us who have been baptized into Christ, who put the old man of sin to death in the watery grave of baptism. We're, we're no longer living in sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh while we're here, once we become a Christian, the time that we have left here in this life, no longer, he said, for human passions. God, there's our purpose. That while in this life, those of us who've given our lives over to the Lord, obedience, we need to spend the remainder of our time doing God's will. The past suffers doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passion, orgies with respect to this. They are surprised them in the sense to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, those who passed on in the flesh the way people are they might live in the spirit the way God does now get into verses 7 through 11 but before we hone in on that I want to go back to these first few verses because he talks about arm yourselves that is to protect or to furnish or to equip yourselves and he says to do it with the same way of thinking as did Christ. We'll come back to that in just a moment. I think you could tie in there 2 Timothy 3, verse number 12, when Paul said, All that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You're saying that you're not going to go through life as a Christian without any suffering, without any persecution, without any pain or troubles. He's bringing Christ in, and Christ came to this low land of sin and sorrow, and He suffered. And so, too, will you and I. The second part of that verse, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Brad, a moment ago, just read for us Romans 6, beginning of verse 1. Can we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We can't continue to live and ex expect God's grace to cover us if we continue to... If the more we sin, the more grace we get. That's not what he's saying. We have put to death, crucified, an old man of sin in the waters of baptism. And so we need to be remind reminding us of that, that you have ceased from that lifestyle so as to live for the rest of time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2 verse 20, what he's saying is, yes, I'm still here. I'm living in this, I've got this flesh, but, I, but I, I've given the fleshly desires and passions up, and now Christ is taken over. He's in control, and I'm living for him. Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, heart and mind, so that you may prove what is that perfect will of God. And so we've got to remember these things. And so he says again in verse 3, the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Want to do. And then he talks about this was your former life, and this is the world in which you live. This is the lifestyle, the attitudes and actions that these people engage in. 
With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. James 4 verse 4, I believe it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, you know, know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. 2 Corinthians 6 verse number 14, I believe says, we're to, As believers, we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That is, we're not to participate in the sinful acts in which the world participates. Peter's saying, you've given that up. And because you're living a different lifestyle than the world, a life for Jesus Christ, he says people are going to be surprised by that. How many of you who have lived out, all of us have, but think about some of you have maybe just recently come to Christ and you think about the life that you lived the sinful, wicked ways that you were back there in the past, and you come out of that, the people that you had associated with, the people that had participated in that lifestyle with you, how do they look at you now? They may be surprised, right? That you're no longer agreeing with that lifestyle. You're no longer participating in that. And in connection with that, don't be surprised, he says, when they malign you. That is, when they persecute you or make fun of you or mock you. That's a human uh, reaction to when people give up that lifestyle. You know, we see it all the time. We, whether we watch television or our news or we watch our podcast, you know, Christianity is under attack. And the world around us is somewhat surprised when, you know what, we're going to keep living for Jesus. We're going to keep living differently. And it's not to be judgmental or this or that or to, to think ourselves above anybody else. That's not it at all. We have Christ living in us now. And as a result, that prompts us to live differently than the world. And in so doing, as a result, the world will sometimes cause problems. Get down to verse number 7. Let's begin taking some notes. I'm smiling at Bryce because he fixed me up with a new PowerPoint, a newer version. And so probably for the next few weeks, you're going to see some fonts that you've never seen before. But I just think they're cool. All right, can you read that? Think soberly. Think soberly. I can't read it, blame Bryce. He's the one that set me up. Notice verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now, the end of all things is at hand. Now what does that mean? Well, let's remember in any book that we study, book of the Bible, we need to understand, okay, who was it originally written to and why? And what's it mean to us? Again, 1 Peter was written to Christians of the first century. And they were suffering. They were being persecuted because of their faith in Christ Jesus. But not only that, he's going to tell them that if you think it's bad now, guess what? It's going to get worse. The book of 1 Peter was written sometime before 70 A.D., the destruction of Jerusalem. Most scholars believe it was written early in the early 60s to mid, between 60 and 65 A.D. So he's writing to Christians who've come out of the world, both Jew and Gentile. Gentiles given up pagan deities and idolatry and everything that was associated with that. Jews had given up and had left Judaism and had given those things up. And now they're following Jesus Christ. They're in the system, the faith. And they're going to be persecuted because of this. But not only that, he's saying it's going to intensify because the time is at hand. And I believe what he's saying, or the end of all things is at hand. I believe he's saying here... It's not the end of the world, the second coming of Christ, but rather to the first century, Christians that he was writing to, the Rome was going to destroy the city of Jerusalem. 
Titus was going to come and surround the city. And Jesus had predicted this or he prophesied about this, if you will, in Matthew chapter 24. And God's people were to look for those things when they came and they were to flee. So many of them are going, he said, you're, you're suffering now, but the end of all things is at hand. I think an end of, if you will, Judaism altogether. But you're going, many of them are going to have to leave their homes. They're, they're, they're going to have to go places where they've never been because of persecution. I think that's what he's saying here. Therefore, because of this, you need to be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. We need to think soberly. The Lord's thoughts, His focus, His purpose was on doing God's will. Remember in John 9 verse 4, he said, I must be about my father's business. And his business was to die on Calvary, to seek and to save the lost, Luke 19 verse 10. And as that day neared, as his day of crucifixion neared, think about it, his mind, his heart, his thoughts, his mental faculties were under control, weren't they? Remember in Luke 22, verse 42, as he prayed to God, not my will, but, but thine be done. He, he know, he's, he's already suffering, but he's going to suffer even more. He's going to die a cruel death on Calvary. And Peter admonished his readers to arm themselves with that same mindset, verse 1. Because the end, like Christ's, was at hand, verse 7. Again, Peter was writing just a few short years before the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of this city and its temple, which embodied Judaism, and to the non-discerning eye of a heathen, also Christianity, would unleash a severe persecution against the people of God. So in light of this serious persecution, Christians would need to have their wits about them. All those who were true to Christ would have nothing to fear if they were mentally and spiritually prepared. And so to be of a sound mind is to be ruled by one's mind that is self-controlled and temperate. Do you remember the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning of verse 24? He asked a question. He says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? He's going back to physical race. He says, you, you know these things. So, he says to Christians, run that you may obtain it. It is our eternal reward. Every athlete, he says, exercises self-control in all things. Think soberly. Contrast that to what the wise man said in Proverbs 25, verse 28. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Their sobriety was to be unto prayer in order that they might be in a state of mind which was conducive to prayer life. They would have a need of constant communication to God above their Heavenly Father through the avenue of prayer, especially was going to happen to them. For us today, the end, death and the judgment is coming. We don't know when, but it is. Hebrews 9, beginning of verse 27, as is it appointed unto men once to die, but after this judgment, 2 Corinthians 5, beginning of verse 10, talks about we'll stand before God in judgment. That time is coming. And in this life we will suffer, thus it behooves us to stay focused mentally, to think soberly, to exercise self-control. We need to have our wits about us. The world is evil. People trying to, you know, cause us to stumble. And so we need to be ready for that and always think clearly. 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning at verse 1. Remember Paul says to the church there, he says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as a trail born woman with child, and they shall not escape. And then he says, on down in verse 5, ye are, well, but ye are brother, but ye, brother, in verse 4, are, in dark, are not in darkness, rather, that that day should overtake you as a thief. 
He says, you are the children of light, the children of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us, notice, let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. I think about Philippians chapter 4 beginning I believe verse 7 and following. It talks about thinking on these things, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are pure, all these things. Think on these things. You're not thinking like the world. We're sober minded. Number two, we need to love sincerely. You may want to put the word love spiritually there. Go back to verse 2. It says so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions. And then in verses 3 and 4, he lists some of those things, those fleshly desires, those selfish fleshly desires. And then contrast that verse number 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. And so you and I, as God's people in this life, are to love sincerely, genuinely, spiritually, again the contrast, human passions, selfish, fleshly, loving one another earnestly, selfless, spiritual. And so verse 8, one translation reads as follows. Above all things, being fervent in your love among yourselves. It's not just now about me. That, that's what he's saying back there in verse number 2. That old lifestyle that you've given up, it was about your own passions your own interest in love. But he's saying now that love is to be outward. We're to love others. It's selfless. We're to love sincerely. This last word is emphatic in the original text, the Greek text. Why is this virtue so important? Well, remember, Peter has, has just spoken of the great calamity that was to fall around them. Times were already difficult and the persecutions, trials, and hardships were soon to increase. Under such trying and extenuating circumstances, the church must be a loving and harmonious unit. We need one another now more than ever. It's no longer focused on me, it's Christ and those around us. And this love covers a multitude of sins, it says. That is, when love dominates a person's life and being, he is not a fault finder. When love is the controlling force in our lives, we will not be looking for sins in our brother's lives. Proverbs 10 verse 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5, the second part of that says, Love takes not account of evil. Now, I, I don't mean by that, and it's, the inspired writers don't mean by that that we just simply overlook sin. We, we have an obligation to our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in sin to go to them and try to snatch them out of the fires of hell, James chapter 5 teaches. We then who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. We've got to warn the unruly and support the weak, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 14. But we're not going around this life just looking, oh, I'm looking for you to fall, looking for you to fall, looking for you to fall. That's not the attitude we're to have. We need to be encouragers. We need to love sincerely. I, I mentioned last Sunday morning, and in the introduction alluded to John 13, 34 and 35, and I told you last Sunday that's sandwiched in between what was said about Judas Jesus said, basically told Judas to go do what he needed to do. He was going to betray the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. And Lord's own disciple. And then after verse 35, he's talking to Peter and basically telling Peter what he's going to do. You're going to deny me three times before this night's over. These are the Lord's disciples and between that too, and you think about the friction that would have caused, especially amongst the Lord's disciples soon after Jesus was crucified. The finger pointing that could have went on. He said, here's what I want you to do. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. For by this shall all men know that you, have, that you are my disciples, if you have love one toward another. Peter, you're going to deny me. Judas is going to betray me. All the others are going to run and hide. 
But he says here, after I leave, this is what I want you to do. I want you to love one another. Times are tough, he says. They're going to get tougher. And you're going to need to pull together in harmony and unity and in love to get through these difficult times. And not only that, by this, he says these people out here in the world are going to know that you belong to me because of the love that you have one toward another. And so we have to love Sincerely, we, we live in a very cruel and evil world, a world full of hate and prejudice. We see it all the time. But we need more than ever before to love one another fervently. Again, for by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. Notice number three, we are to serve selflessly. Go down to verse 9. Show hospitality to one another and he says, do it without grumbling. I, I love that. I'm glad he put that in there, aren't you? Because sometimes when we, when we stop and we talk about serving one another, we, we don't always like to do that. And when we do it, we don't always, you know, we kind of under our breath, I don't want to have to serve him. He's saying, put that away. He says, I want you to serve one another selflessly and I want you to do it without grumbling. Serve selflessly. Peter admonishes his readers to unselfishly give of time and substance to help those that were in want as a result of persecution. Remember what was going to happen. Many of them were going to be homeless. Many of them imprisoned. And he's saying in this time of suffering and persecution, God's people are to serve one another selflessly. They were to gladly offer the hospitality of their homes to Christians deprived of home and livelihood by the persecutors, remembering that they are but stewards of God's gracious gifts. Verse 9 and 10. What we have, God has given us. We've been, we've been entrusted with these things that belong to Him. And we're to use them to His glory, to, to encourage, to do good, to, to help our fellow man. That's what He's saying here. They were to be kind to others outside their immediate household. The Bible says in Galatians 6, beginning at verse number 9, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. Hebrews 13, beginning at verse number 1, the Hebrew writer says, Let brotherly love continue. It's not something that stops after once or twice. He says, I want you to let that continue. You keep on loving. And then he says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. In the first century, Christians, again, were being persecuted. Many of them slain, put to death, but many of them thrown into prison. The prison systems were not like we have today. Scott and Jeff and others work for the prison system. and they're many, Yes, they've been deprived of their freedoms, many of their freedoms, because of wrongdoings. Remember, Christians in the first century, as well as Christians today, suffer many times not for any wrongdoing of their own, but because of evilness of the world around them. And so in the first century, they, they didn't have all the luxuries that we have in prisons today. And so they, some of these, these, these people that were thrown in prison had to be taken care of. And it was God's people, Christians' responsibility to see to it that they took. And the Hebrew writer is saying, remember, because it could be you in that situation. And so you want to do to them as Matthew 7 verse 12 as you would want to be done as well. And so we need to remember that. What better way to arm ourselves against the forces of evil than to love and to serve one another selflessly? I can't think of anything better to do. To help our thinking soberly, to keep our minds off or become victims to suffering, to keep us from doing that than serving other people. It's so simple. I've told you all, you know, when I'm having a bad day and depressed and things aren't going uh, well for me, I could sit and dwell on that. It's only going to make matters worse, right? 
Or I can do something positive, and I choose many times to do the positive. And so I'll leave whatever it is I'm doing because I'm stuck here, I can't figure this out, and I'll go do something good for somebody else. You know what happens? I feel a whole lot better for having done it. It gets my mind off the suffering or off the problems I'm facing, and it makes me realize I'm still, I've still got some... I've got some good qualities about me. Not, not to pat myself on the back it makes me feel good. I go from a worthless state to feeling pretty valuable. But not only that, I find out there are people out there a lot worse off than me. And there's always somebody worse off than us. We need to serve selflessly. And then finally, we need to speak scripturally. Verse 6, it says... For this is why the gospel is preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the Spirit the way God does. Go down to verse number um, 11. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by that in everything, or rather serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. We need to speak scripturally the purpose for preaching the gospel was and is to show sinful men a better way of life the means by which they can be saved for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish its foolishness but unto us which are being saved it is the power of God first Corinthians 1 verse 18 I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God and the salvation of everyone that believe it to the Jew first and also to the Greek Romans 1 verse number 16 and so to help arm or to protect ourselves and others against the onslaught of the world we must speak scripturally that is the message of God preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine 2 Timothy 4 verse Number two, and so we've got to guard our mouths, our tongues. James chapter 3, beginning at verse number 1. Our speech as well as our conduct must be wholesome, it must be holy, it must be pure. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which uh, which is good for the use of edification or edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Remember what Paul said in Colossians 4, he asked for prayers on his behalf and and proclaiming the gospel to give him utterance. He says in verse 5 of Colossians 4, Conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Go back to chapter 3 of 1 Peter, verse 15, being ready always to give an answer of the hope that is within us the judgment day as we close out the judgment day will come for all and until it does we're in this life we're going to suffer and so to help arm or protect ourselves against it so that we will be ready for that day we must heed the words of Peter and think soberly we need to love sincerely we need to serve selflessly and we need to speak scripturally these four admonitions will make the struggles And the sufferings we face in this life, they'll make them bearable. They'll make them bearable. And they too will help keep us focused on what's most important. And that's the spiritual. Colossians 3 beginning at verse number 1. I found this on Facebook this morning and I liked it. I thought, boy, that kind of goes in with what I'm going to say. And it was anonymous. I don't know who said it, but it said this. Never stop being a good person because of bad people. Keep doing good. This morning, as I look out over this audience, I know there are some here that have never put Christ on in baptism. Today's that day. You don't want to delay in that. You want to to do it now. The, The best life one can live in this life is the Christian life. We experience the abundant life in Jesus, John 10, verse number 10. Why would you want to live any other life? Yes, we're going to suffer. Yes, there's things we must give up but it's still the greatest life we could live. And we live in this life and suffer, but we have hope. Those outside the fold of safety today have no hope. Hope can only be given and granted to those who are in Christ. And so this morning, if we can assist you in your obedience to the gospel, or as a Christian, you've erred from the faith, maybe you've allowed suffering to get you down. 
We can pray with you or pray for you. We stand ready to assist you. Will you come now together? We stand as we sing.